Thanks. I'm going to talk about uh, deflection, how we might deflect uh, an asteroid that in the future would be on a, an, in, uh, an impact trajectory with the Earth. I'll talk about the target for this mission, the Didymos Dimorphous Binary System, how the DART mission was designed, what happened as far as we understand at present a, a, when DART reached Didymos and Dimorphous last September, and the next steps in this burgeoning uh, field of planetary defence. So let's start off with why we need planetary defence in the first place. For those of us who were watching the news uh, uh, just uh, over 10 years ago, we'll all be aware that unexpectedly an 18 meter diameter asteroid entered the Earth's atmosphere over the city, uh, Russian city of Chelyabinsk. Now, uh, this was a small asteroid, 18 meters across. The Earth's atmosphere is very good at protecting us from objects as small as this. And yet the shock wave from the high altitude explosion still injured 1,600 people in that city, simply by blowing out windows, doors, knocking over walls, and so on. The larger the asteroid, the further into our atmosphere it penetrates. And if you are at a, a roughly 120, 140 meters across or larger, the atmosphere cannot protect us no matter what the structure of the asteroid is. It will reach the ground as far as the, uh, the theoretical simulations show, and you've got a bad day. Well, what do we do about this? First of all, we try to find them. And these are images of two of these near-Earth asteroid or near-Earth object surveys that I've been associated with in my career. Currently, I'm working with the ATLAS uh, project, uh, which has four telescopes situated around the world, two in Hawaii, one in South Africa, and one in Chile. Uh, I've also worked with the 1.8 meter pan stars facility, and here I am being a medium-sized astronomer next to the world's, currently the world's largest digital image of 1.8 gigapixels in this camera. And what these telescopes are designed to do is simply survey the night sky whenever it's clear at those observatories and look for moving dots of light because the asteroids are in orbit about our sun and as they travel in their orbits relative to the Earth, they will move relative to the background stars and galaxies. So here's an example. Here we've got a small field of view. This is a negative image, so the stars and galaxies appear as black dots against a, a paler uh, background. And if one looks very closely, one can see that most of these objects stay in the same place between these three images, but there does seem to be an object moving along here. And in fact, these are the discovery images back in 1996 of near-Earth asteroid Didymos. Now, this effort has been going on for decades. These telescopes are in operation 24 hours a day, 365 or six days a year. And as the number of telescopes involved has increased, and our detected technology has increased, and our software to automatically dis, uh, locate moving objects has grown in sophistication, the number of near-Earth asteroids discovered, of course, has increased as well, until, as we see at the end of last month, we are, we are now at over 30,000 near-Earth asteroids discovered. And in fact, as of yesterday, when I updated this slide, we had 31,485, of which over 2,300 are potentially hazardous. These are asteroids large enough that if they hit us, we'll punch through the atmosphere and make it to ground level. And also, although they may not be on an impact trajectory at the moment, i.e. their orbits do not precisely cross the Earth's orbit, they pass within 0.05 astronomical units of, of the Earth's orbit. We've also got, we also discover, by the way, comets and anything else that's moving out there with the with these surveys. And importantly, at the moment, on average, we discover an, another eight previously unknown near-Earth asteroids every 24 hours. There's a lot out there. And as you can see from this graph showing the total number discovered, um, 
as a function of time, this curve is still accelerating upwards. We are nowhere near uh, find, having found them all yet. Now, the good thing about these surveys are twofold. First of all, these discoveries allow us to model the population of near-Earth asteroids in the inner solar system and then calculate from that population, on average, how often do they hit the Earth? So we have graphs like this from Brown et al. about 10 years ago now, where we can calculate the, the total number hitting, uh, of objects at this size, maybe the equivalent diameter and larger, hitting the Earth per year. Now, when, we, when, it's, when it's down to objects just a few meters across, they hit us quite often. In fact, you go down to a few meters across, we get of order of one or two impacts every year. And again, these are small asteroids. They burn up uh, high up in the atmosphere. And you might have seen on the news that about a month ago, we had a, a small asteroid come in over the English Channel and, and explode just over the north coast of France. As we go to larger sizes, the number of near-Earth asteroids decreases, which is a good thing. And therefore, the impact frequency drops until you get to objects that are maybe 150 meters across or so, and they only hit the Earth on average every 30,000 years, according to our telescopic surveys. Now, first of all, however, you'll notice that there is some uncertainty in these numbers, and we certainly, at uh, these small sizes, are not uh, confident to within probably about a factor two or so of the total numbers and probably more. Secondly, this is the average impact rate. You know that if you're trying to catch a bus or a tube hopefully in period this evening, you'll turn up at the stop or the station and one will turn up eventually, but you may not know exactly when. And so the other idea behind the surveys is to find these objects. When we find them, we track them, we calculate their orbits and we predict where they're going in the next 100 years. Do we have to worry about that particular object over the next century or so? And this is done, as I said, continuously during every 24 hour period. So at some point, we will find an asteroid on a trajectory. In fact, we've already done that seven times. These were all small, asteroids between one and four meters across. We knew they would burn up harmlessly or explode harmlessly in the upper atmosphere. But at some point, because this is a natural process, we will find something larger that is going to hit us in the next hundred years. And what do we do? Well, we, of course, we discover it, we track it, we assess the risk of impact. And if we do nothing, then if we straighten out the orbit of the asteroid relative to the Earth, it will hit us. So the idea is that you don't do nothing. You intersect it at some point before it reaches us and deflect it and move it onto a different path around the sun, onto a different orbit. And if you put it into a different orbit, that means it will still come close to us at that time in the future, but its orbit has changed enough that it will miss us. So that's the idea between planetary defense. The throw out uh, your ideas of nuking things in orbit, although you know that's, that's a, certainly a, a, a last-ditch uh, effort. If you need to do that, you've, you've left it too late. The idea behind planetary defence is to is to locate these objects well before they impact, many years, if not decades, and then deflect them so that when they do approach our planet at the predicted time, they pass us close uh, safely by. Sorry, let me just, um, I hate that, sorry. I, I know I stopped it, but uh, I just need to put myself on, onto focus. Thank you. Do not disturb. Thank you very much. Right, let me, let me continue playing this again. Uh, okay, where did my talk go now? There we go, uh, down here. There we go. Okay. So. There have been many technologies <laughs> theorized about how we might move an asteroid. And the simplest one is still the best one because it's the one we can probably attempt now. And that's the kinetic deflector technique. 
where very simply you take your spacecraft and ram it into the asteroid and conservation of momentum means that asteroid will also end up with that momentum so it will move either a bit faster this way or if you hit it the other way it will it will slow down a little bit now if you are only dealing with the spacecraft you've got the momentum of the spacecraft its mass times its velocity relative to the asteroid and that in a, a purely inelastic collision where the spacecraft effectively merges with the asteroid will give will mean that you impart that same momentum so you have much larger mass and the change in velocity of the asteroid is therefore very much smaller but it should be enough to move deflect it onto a new orbit about the sun uh, so that it misses us sometime in the future but as this graphic um, implies there's an extra factor that we have to take into account when you ram your spacecraft into the asteroid it will eject material from the surface of that asteroid. That material, that ejector, also has momentum. And as that momentum is going that way, that will also move the asteroid this way. So you have two parts, or two components of your momentum moving the asteroid. You have the momentum from the spacecraft originally hitting it, but you also have this momentum coming from the material that you throw out, you eject from the asteroid itself during that collision. And we quantify this in a single number called beta. Effectively, it's the total amount of momentum change you impart on the asteroid divided by the original momentum for the spacecraft itself. If you don't eject anything, then beta will be one because you just end up with the momentum you start. If you do manage to eject material, then beta will be greater than one. And the great unknown in planetary defense studies up until now has been how efficient is the kinetic impact of technology? How efficient could it be? Forget everything else about actually managing to hit a small asteroid at, at multiple kilometers per second. If you do manage to hit it, how far will it move? Sorry, this uh, seems to have, my battery seems to have stopped. No, it's not. Okay. There we go. Okay. So the point is, is that if we have beta of one, there's no ejector, and you only have the momentum of your impact in spacecraft. If you're lucky, you have a beta of two. So you have as, you have as much momentum from the ejector as you do from the original spacecraft, and the asteroid will move more. If you have a beta of four, then you really do move that asteroid, and the kinetic impact of technology is incredibly efficient. And you might say, well, surely, with our sophisticated computer codes, with what we know about asteroids and their composition, we can predict how efficient the kinetic impact it would be. And the answer is we can't. Here, for example, is a, 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 a series of plots from a recent study just published last year where they were using sophisticated uh, hydrodynamics code and impact code to try to calculate how, what this efficiency factor, this beta factor would be. And depending on how you hit it, depending on even the shape of your spacecraft, because beta depends on exactly uh, your impact trajectory, do you hit it head on or are you at an angle? It depends on the yield strength of the rocks, the porosity of, the, of that asteroid. In turn, it depends on the internal friction between the ast those asteroid components and indeed even the spacecraft shape. And you can see in these, th these three different runs, um, depending on either two different codes or just look at, uh, or looking at the difference between an uh, inherently weak asteroid, a structurally weak asteroid, and a structurally strong asteroid, we can have betas ranging from 1 up to about 1.3, if your asteroid is quite coherent, to between 2 and 2.7, if it's very weak, or and if you then use a, a, this hydro code, it could be even five, six, seven. We had a huge range 
of predicted outcomes of using the kinetic impactor technique. So let's go and test it. This is the idea between the dark machine. And the dark, and to test it, you need a target. And the target chosen was this binary asteroid called 65803 Didymos. If you're wondering, this means it's the 65,803rd asteroid to have its orbit around the sun accurately calculated. And it's called Didymos because somebody wanted to call it Didymos. Um, now, these are light curves, so measurements of the brightness of the asteroid as a function of time made by uh, a Czech uh, astronomy group led by Peter Pravec. And one can see it's a bit of a mess it, if, you, if you try to uh, look at and overclock these light curves, the brightness of the asteroid as a function of time from night to night, it looks pretty messy. But you can decompose these light curves. And what you end up with seeing is, first of all, down here, by following down here, here we see a, a, a regular signal in that light curve where the brightness it starts dim and then grows again and gets dim again every 2.2592 hours. And this is the signature of the central, the main asteroid itself, Didymos. But when you take out that signal from the slide curve, you end up with something like this, where you end up with a relatively flat, constant brightness, but every so often, the brightness still dips. And that's caused by a second asteroid in orbit about the, about Didymos. It, that shows us that Didymos has a moon. Now, it can be difficult seeing this from a light curve, but at the same time, back in 2003, when Didymos was making a close approach to the Earth, a, a radar, a planetary radar was used, uh, in particular the Arecibo uh, radio telescope, down in Puerto Rico, which unfortunately, as you may know, doesn't exist anymore because it uh, unfortunately collapsed uh, a couple of years ago. But uh, here we can see the radar returns from that asteroid as it passed close to us in 2003. And this is just a sequence of images. You're, you're bouncing the radio waves off the asteroid and receiving them back on Earth. But in each of these individual images, if you look, you can see a little dot of an extra bit of ray, radar reflection. And this is that moon of Didymos orbiting. And so we knew from the, at the observation in 2003 that Didymos was a binary asteroid. And in fact, this is effectively what Didymos and Dimorphos looked like according to those observations. We have the primary asteroid Didymos itself about 780 meters across. Its moon is much smaller, it's only 160 meters across, and it orbits at a distance between the centers of the, or uh, uh, rather a separation of, between the centers of the two asteroids of 1.2 kilometers. And it orbits very, very, we know the orbital period very, very precisely from those measurements plus others made in subsequent years when the asteroid was much more distant. So to put this into context, Asteroids are small, they're much smaller than planets. There's a beautiful image of Mars at the back end, and it's much smaller than, than, than the kinds of planetary bodies that uh, Sanjeev works on. So let's put this into context. Here we are. Here's Imperial College here, and we can dump down Didymos and Dimorphos onto Imperial College. Yes, yes, I think I've hit admin. I, I hope that's okay. Um, but one can see that this is a relatively small asteroid system. Did I? Oh, sorry. I'm guessing that everybody in Earth Sciences isn't too unhappy about that. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, I apologise to my physics colleagues. Okay, so this is the, the asteroid system that was picked as the target for our first test of deflected technology with DART. And it's a perfect system. Why is it a perfect system? Well, first of all, we knew from its orbit about the sun that Didymos and its moon Dimorphos would be back around, it would be close to our planet again in September last year. Then it also means we can measure how easy we can move a small asteroid, not by Did Didymos, but its moon Dimorphos. And just for, in case there are any physicists here, this, this is the equation for the orbital energy 
of an object in orbit. It depends on the kinetic energy and the gravitational potential energy of that object, and that's going to be written like this. If we hit an asteroid at a particular point in its orbit, either if it's orbiting another asteroid or if it's orbiting the sun, then at that point, the gravitational potential energy doesn't change, but we change the kinetic energy. So we change the total energy of the asteroid. And if we differentiate this, we can see how much we change the orbit, the, the size of the orbit of the asteroid, depending on how much we change the energy. And then if we know how, how much we change the kinetic energy, uh, we've, ch we've changed the orbit, and then we have uh, a change, therefore, in the orbit period of that asteroid about the sun or about another asteroid, and we can measure that either by measuring the orbital period or the velocity. So basically, what happens is that if we hit the asteroid head on and slow it down, and the energy decreases, so the separation of that asteroid with its, or with its parent body decreases, and that means it, its A is decreased, the orbital period is decreased, the velocity increases. So this is what made Demore this an ideal target. We've got Dimorphos orbiting Didymos every 11 hours and 55 minutes. Yes, thank you. I've just said it's Didymos. Sorry, I forgot this was this was coming up. And what we do then is we hit it with our spacecraft dart. If beta is one, if we hit Dimorphos with a spacecraft of mass 570 kilograms, just over half a ton, but moving at over six kilometers per second, and it ejects nothing, there's no ejector, we just have the momentum of the spacecraft, then we would expect the orbital period to decrease by seven minutes. Here's the dark spacecraft in detail. It's quite a small spacecraft. It, most spacecraft, when we send them out there to explore the solar system, are, are like Christmas trees. They've got instruments and cameras and spectacles hanging off every corner. Not DART. DART had one instrument, which was the Draco camera, because all it needed to do was find this asteroid, find the moon of Dynamos, and make sure it reached it. Now, it did have other things such as these rollout uh, solar arrays, which were tested on the International Space Station before they were, they were approved for working on DART. It had, a, had an iron engine and it had a smart nav and leisure cube, which I'll mention in a minute. Anyway, so these were then, therefore, the level one requirements of the DART mission. First of all, actually get to Dimorphos and impact it during its close approach. Remember, you're trying to hit a 160 meter object which you've never even seen directly from Earth in a telescope because it's so close to its parent asteroid that you can only, you're, you're basically all you get is the light from the parent asteroid. So you have to use the techniques of radar and um, measuring the brightness of the asteroid, it's like us, to predict where Dimorphos will be when DART gets there. Then you need to hit it as close to the center as possible so you change the binary Period. And we knew that if we changed it, we should be able to measure any change greater than 73 seconds uh, so easily. So we should do that. In fact, if we, in fact, we think that we should be able to measure it within 7.3 seconds. So we should measure the period change and therefore measure this beta efficiency factor. How well, how efficiently can we move a small asteroid? Well, just to give you an idea of how big DART was, it wasn't big. This is DART. This is before they put on the last avionics uh, and power panel on the side here. And then, of course, the, 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 the solar panels are quite large going out either side when they extend. But it's not a big spacecraft. Again, it only, with, with, it's only just over 600 kilograms mass at launch, and it'd be about 570 kilograms when it reaches the asteroid. Anyway, the launch occurred in November 2021, so almost a year and a half ago now, and everybody's seen a rocket launch, but what's nice is that there was a camera actually on the upper stage when it had already uh, uh, put itself on an interplanetary trajectory to start DART on its way, and here's the movie from the upper stage showing DART leaving that upper stage 55 minutes after launch on its way to 
Didymos and Eumorphus. Now, of course, it's not going straight there because everything is in orbit about the Sun. So here we can see the relative orbits of Didymos and, D and the Earth. And then here in November 2021, DART is launched. And you can see its trajectory. It's not going to go that far from Earth because we're letting Didymos and Dimorphos come around in this orbit to its predicted close approach in September 2022, last year. And so this was the uh, trajectory that DART followed. And indeed, it reached the system on September the 26th last year, when the asteroid itself was actually relatively close to the Earth. And of course, that's very good because it means we are in constant communication with the satellite and with the mission. It's very easy to do. Oh, there we go. Um, so, oh no, I didn't mean to go back. Go on, go back. Right, okay, let's just watch that animation again. Um, there we go. Nope. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so basically, when it gets there, the, uh, just to point out, we are in regular contact with the spacecraft during its cruise space, and then things heat up in the last month. It could only really detect Didymos with the Draco camera on board in, during the last 30 days of the mission, and indeed, that's what happened. For the last 10 days, we are in constant communication with the spacecraft. Eight hours before it reaches the system, it's the so-called pre-terminal phase, when that's the last chance. If you want to, going to do something to DART, that's the last chance you have to upload new commands or, or, or decide to on, on anything else. But we, by that stage, eight hours, we are we have done the last course correction. It's far too late for us to do any course correction. Then at four hours before impact, we it's hands off. And this and the spacecraft then moves to fully autonomous behavior. It's up to DART to hit Dimorphos. 60 minutes before it reaches the system, that's when we expect it to first see. Dimorphos for the first time, to be able to see it next to its much larger and brighter parent asteroid Didymos. Three minutes before impact, we should be getting good views of both Didymos and the target, Dimorphos. Two minutes, you're starting to lose or we really are losing Didymos. And then at 20 seconds before impact, during this time, I should say, DART is controlling itself, it's firing its thrusters to make sure it hits Dimorphos. At 20 seconds before impact, that stops because we don't want the smart nav, auto, uh, the, the smart nav system to suddenly decide it's going to hit something over here when Dimorphos is over here. So for the last 20 seconds, it's coasting. <coughs> now, I'd love this shot. So, we actually detected with DART Dimorphos 70 minutes, not 60 minutes, 70 minutes before we the system. There. I'm not sure you can see it because the lights are quite bright here, but there's a little faint dot there. Remember, this is the first time we've got an optical image of the asteroid that we're actually going to hit. Yeah, it's, it, was, it was a good reaction uh, at APL over on the East Coast because we suddenly, that's the first time we went, oh my God, this is real, it's actually happening. Now, I've already shown you a version of this movie at the start, but this is now the movie as seen from the SmartNav system. And we're starting five minutes before impact and we'll run up. And you can see that the SmartNav has already detec has detected Didymos, it's detected Dimorphos. We're on a precision lock. We reached precision lock 30 minutes, or actually 40 minutes, I think, um, before impact, which means that it knows it's got to hit that thing and not that thing, or even these little boulders on uh, on Didymos that it also detects. And you, here you can see zoom ups of uh, Dimorphos and Didymos, and here's some some thresholded view to help it do that impact. And as you can see, as we roll in, it's using these images taken once a second to fire the thrusters continuously to try to maintain Dimorphos along the center track. And it's doing this without any 
in, in intervention from the ground. And although it occasionally does seem to do quite a large deviation, that was expected from the, from the many, many simulations run uh, the, on the ground with the software. And you can see that it actually worked. And the best image of the mission is this one. Because this was taken a second, roughly a second before impact. But when we saw this, we knew it hadn't managed to send it all, just a fraction of it, because it had hit the waters. Dark was no more, and we had actually hit the small asteroid. Now, of course, once dark is destroyed, you've got no more data. You've got no more images from DART itself. And you have to, oh, sorry, my, my things are out of sight. But where did we hit? Well, thankfully, the first batch of nature papers were put out for early release last night. So I can now show you these images. That's a relief. So DART hit pretty much here. Here's one of the last images. Or, or uh, uh, this, I think, was something like 11 seconds before impact showing dimorphous. Here on an outline, is, or graphically, is the outline of DART. And as you can see, actually, when DART went in, tracking precisely where it was going, actually the body of the spacecraft hit between these two large boulders on the surface. Um, but it, it turns out that DART, did, the DART spacecraft itself wasn't quite the first thing to hit it. If you look at the actual trajectory coming in, it was the solar panels that hit those boulders in the, first, in, in the last microseconds of flight. So it was the, it was the um, solar panels that hit first before the main body imparted most of the kinetic energy into that impact site. So we know exactly where DART hit. Now, I'll just point out um, one thing that is, had us jump for joy in this image and the previous images. Uh, this is what we hoped we'd see. This is a rubble pile asteroid. It is not a coherent body. And our best theory of how binary asteroids form predicted that what we would have is a loose conglomeration of small fragments of asteroid pretty much just held together by self-gravity, nothing else. And indeed, that's what we saw. This is the shape which we didn't expect. This is the three-dimensional shape derived from the dark images. This is kind of left and right. This is forwards and backwards. This is from the top. Basically, it's a big smarty. Or, so apologies to my American colleagues, it's a big m, &M. And we, we expected more of an ellipsoid. We expected more of a rugby ball shape, to put it bluntly. And we weren't expecting this. But this, you can see where we overlay the, the uh, stereo imagery from DART onto this, uh, onto this model. It, it fits very, very nicely. In fact, we believe the, the uncertainties are only about a meter or less over 160 meters. So we, so the, that was the first surprise of the mission that Dimorphos wasn't the shape that we expected to hit. Now, once Dart's gone, you can't get any more images from Dart, and and of course we are all running a huge number of telescopes on Earth. So when when Dart hits, where well, we have to stop when it hits. This is a sequence of images that I took with my colleagues using the Atlas telescope in South Africa, which was well placed to observe the contact. Now, from, from, from Earth, you don't even see stuff happening, but not a lot of detail. And this is where Leisure Cube comes in. Leisure Cube was a small CubeSat carried by DART, built and provided by the Italian space agency, ASI. And it had two cameras on board, because its whole idea was just simply had one mission, which was to image what happened after uh, Dart hit Dimorphos. Of course, you've got to think of, spend a lot of time thinking of your names of your cameras. So we have Luke and Leia 
you have to, really. You must know Star Wars. Okay. Um, and it was, Leisure Cube was actually released from Dart 15 days before Impact. So that it, with that particular, at that particular point, releasing at that point meant that it would in, fly through the system at the same velocity as Dart entered the system, 6.1 kilometers per second, but it would arrive there three minutes afterwards. And it would actually importantly miss the asteroids by between 50 and 60 kilometers because you know it would be nice, but you don't want to do two impacts. We want to know what happened during the dark impact. So here's a sequence of images from Leisure Cube. It starts while uh, Leisure Cube is still 700 over 770 kilometers from Didymos and Dimorphos. And here in in its images, you can just you can see Didymos and just about Dimorphos in the images. As we play the sequence, you can see when you can see how it gets better, bigger as it flies by. You can see material around the Now it's difficult to see these images uh, in this in this sequence, and unfortunately, I can't show any more at the moment because there are still publications being prepared. But I can show you this. So this is just after closest approach. Here we have Didymos. Here we have Dimorphos. And you can see this beautiful ejector cone of material coming out from where Dart has come in to Dimorphos this way, and it's extending outwards. Now, at this scale, you can see that clearly there's ejector. Remember, the distance between these two asteroids is about 1.2 kilometers. So you can see this ejector is stretching out hundreds of meters. That by no means tells the full story. If we take a wider field of view taken before closest approach and stretch it, Dimorphos is in here, here's Didymos, and we can see the ejector already just minutes after, a minute or so, or two minutes after impact, stretching many, many tens of kilometers. Now, as I said, this, this, uh, these images are still being analyzed. And so uh, we can't show much more than this at the moment, but the, uh, the paper, I believe, it is, uh, is being submitted in the next few days. So it won't be too long before some of these results come out. But we do have the next best thing. We have the Hubble Space Telescope. So here is a sequence of images taken from the Hubble Space Telescope 0.7 days after impact almost five days after impact, and then almost 12 days after impact. If we look at this, what happens within uh, a day of impact, remember that ejector cone of material thrown out by the dark impact, where it's now stretching hundreds of kilometers away from the asteroid system. We also have started forming a tail because the impact released a lot of very small dust particles, and these small dust particles are being blown back by radiation pressure from the sun in the same manner that a comet dust tail forms. Within, in the first few days, we have a lot of distortion of the ejector kicked up by the dark impact, simply because it's floating around a binary asteroid system where the small asteroid is still orbiting the big asteroid. So we can see some distortion of this ejector going on because of the complex dynamics in this system. And then finally, it's hard to see, I'm not sure if, again if you can see it in this room, but I've pointed it out on here, you can see this ejector being blown back because just like the smaller particles in the tail, that ejector is now starting to be blown back by solar radiation pressure in the anti-sunward direction. And in fact, here's a nice little movie uh, released last night for using those HST images showing the evolution of the ejector around the dark, around the asteroid system over a period of about two weeks, I think it is in total, including the forming of the tail. So we do have pretty good resolution images, and these were these data were released in the uh, in the paper release yesterday. Now, apart from telescopes in orbit, such as Hubble Space Telescope and also James Webb Space Telescope, which also uh, was being used, we also used 
a whole gamut of telescopes on Earth, so ranging from the 8.2 meter very large telescopes down in Chile, is one of the four 8.2 meter units down there, through to a 40 centimeter telescope that was ported out to Kenya because of where, the, uh, what, at the, sorry, because of the time the, uh, the impact took place, Africa was the best place to observe. The, uh, the impact. It wasn't visible from Chile at that time, but it was visible from the telescopes in South Africa. And in fact, if we look at a map of the world, these are some of the telescopes that were used to study the impact on impact night and in the subsequent days. Um, it doesn't include them all. But with one nice thing is that if one looks, uh, at the data coming back from the telescopes, we had observations on every of the seven continents on Earth following this uh, first uh, test of kinetic impact of technology. So I think this is a really nice view showing how much the astronomical community wanted to support the DART projects. And I am a member of that astronomical community. So, how much did Dimorphos move? Well, to measure that movement, to measure that orbital change, we used exactly the same techniques that were used to detect the moon in the first place. This shows really a, a block showing what you would see from Earth around impact time or around the, the date of impact if you had a really, really big telescope and could resolve the system. Remember, on Earth, it's just a single dot of light and it's far too small. Even though it's close to Earth, it's far too small to resolve. But what happens is that as Dimorphos orbits Didymos, uh, when Dimorphos is in front of Didymos with respect to the sun, you get a eclipse, you get a shadow. Then as it moves around, what will happen is that is Dimorphos will actually be eclipsed itself by the shadow of Dimorphos. So as Dimorphos orbits Didymos, you'll see two dimmings. And amazingly, Within 24 hours of the impact, the astronomers on the team were measuring these dips in the light curve caused by Dimorphos um, eclipsing Didymos or undergoing those eclipses. Now, I should say that this was also very nice because it, it actually was proof as well within 24 hours that we had completely destroyed the moon, which in theory shouldn't have happened, but it's good to see theory work out in practice. And as I said, we could get these data within one day of impact. And amazingly, if we look at the light curve here, the dotted lines show what we would, where we'd expect to see this primary eclipse and this secondary eclipse. And you can see they're shifted. They're shifted because the orbital period of the moon, the Morphus, Mount Didymos, has changed. We have changed the orbit of this small asteroid. We have moved it. And as time progresses, the shift becomes progressively larger and larger. We also got this result from the ra from radar, which was also being used within 24 hours of impact. These are a slightly later date. Here you can see it from the 4th of October, so about one week after impact. And here we can see a very, it's, uh, we have a, 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 a radar return of Didymos, and here's the radar return from its moon Dimorphos, here and here at these two dates, but the blue circle shows where it would have been if the orbit had not changed. And you can see this even more clearly on, in these data from five days later. And it's quite clear that we have moved the moon. We have moved this asteroid. The old orbital period is here, the new orbital period, measured independently from both the optical telescopes and the radar observations is here, we have changed the, the orbital period of this moon by over half an hour, or almost 33 minutes. And these are one sigma uncertainties. So it was a tremendous success. That's another goal achieved. Now, what about this fact of beta? So I'm sorry, I, I thought there might be more physicists and mathematicians up here, but this is basically how we've defined beta for this experiment. We have to realize that if we look at top down at uh, Didymos and Dimorphos, dark came in along this vector here, the red vector. The ejector, as measured from both Leisure Cube and also from the 
from the uh, ground-based telescopes came out along this orange vector. But what we decided to do, because it's difficult to measure the, the total velocity change, we just want to measure the velocity change along the orbital track, which is this green vector here. So we have to muck about a bit to, to measure beta. And the important thing about this beta is that it depends, uh, the, the efficiency depends on what you move. Now, we know the total mass of the system from Kepler's laws of planetary motion applied to the asteroid system. We know the total mass of the system, which is pretty much the mass of the universe. The Morpheus has only got a mass about 1% of Didymos, and uh, we can't measure that. And we, we don't know the mass at the moment of Dimorphos. But what we can do is we can assume that uh, we can assume that Didymos is as much a rubble pile as Dimorphos and assume they've got the same density. If we do that, well, it, it, we can come up with this kind of graph. So here, along here, we have the, the density, we assume, of the asteroid that we hit. Dimorphous, and up here we have therefore for that density what the value of beta would be. And this is the one, uh, one sigma uncertainty on the system density here. I think that's going to decrease significantly as we, we further analyze the data. This gives us beta. Depends on the density, but if the density of uh, Dimorphous is the same as Didymos, we have a beta of 3.6 which is brilliant, because it means the kinetic deflector technology gives you a momentum transfer onto your target asteroid over three and a half times more, or three, enhanced by the factor of three and a half times over that you'd get from the spacecraft alone, which makes it an incredibly efficient way of moving a small asteroid. But there's, there's clearly, we would like to pin this number down and we, we can't pin it down because we don't know the density of Dimorphos. We don't actually know how we left it either. The images from the Italian CubeSat, Nisha Cube, are too low resolution to actually see in detail what happened there. And it was out of the system too quickly. And if we look at simulations of what might have happened to Dimorphos when DART hits it, we can see when we have seriously changed this small asteroid. So we've got a number of uncertainties left over from this experiment that we are going to address because in October next year, we launch the next mission to the asteroid system. This is the European spacecraft HERA, which will arrive at the system in January, at this, or rather the start of 2027, and instead of just zipping through it or hitting it like DART, it will rendezvous. And it will spend six months, at least six months, precisely doing two things, measuring the mass of Dimorphos so we know what beta is, and it will also measure exactly what the impact site on Dimorphos is like. You, in this image, in this video, for example, you can see that it's not just Hero that will get there. Hero can, will carry with it two CubeSats itself, Juventus and Milani. And Juventus and Milani will assist us in making all these measurements. So for at least for six months and maybe a year, we'll be at this system finishing the experiment, finding out exactly what happened with uh, DART uh, or, or what happened to Dimorphos when DART hit. And in the meantime, we continue surveying for that next impactor, that next significant impactor. And then while we have this suite of sky survey facilities at the moment, starting operation in, in the next two years will be the Rubin Observatory, which every night will discover 30, sorry, 30, about 10 million new objects that were there in that capture in, in the recent portion of the sky survey three nights before. It will go around the sky every three or four nights, many of which will be new near Earth asteroids. As well as that, 
in 2028, NASA will launch the Near Earth Object Surveyor mission. This is an infrared telescope designed for surveying for these objects, all to make sure that if there's an impact of coming towards us in the next hundred years or so, we have a good chance of detecting it. But let me finish here then with a summary. DART successfully performed a high velocity impact on a small asteroid, showing that we can actually build and launch a successful kinetic impactor. It changed the orbital velocity by, I didn't actually mention this, by 2.7 millimeters per second, which led to an orbital period change of 33 minutes. This beta value is uncertain, but a value of three to four means kinetic impactors are highly effective for moving at least small rubble pile, rubble pile asteroids the size of Dimorphos and maybe a little larger. But we haven't finished this experiment yet. The, this precise value of this efficiency and the effect on the asteroid will be measured in the next mission, HERA, which will launch next year and arrive there in 2027. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much, Alan, for a fabulous talk. I can actually sleep soundly tonight, knowing that <laughs> we know the detail back there. Now, questions? Alan? Hi, Matt. Will any, will any of those small fragments that they have that's a really good question. Um, yeah, somebody did that simulation last year. The probability is no, unfortunately. Um, uh, the, I mean, uh, okay, the, in, the, in this, I, I think the simulation only followed the, the, the ejector for a few orbital periods and it didn't reach a. Um, uh, so, according to that simulation, no. Uh, but we know a lot more about what happened there. There were a lot of things that happened in that jet that we weren't expecting. So, for example, this filamentary structure, nobody expected that. We think it's related to the distribution of boulders on the surface of the amorphous. And clearly, there, there's physics going on in that ejector, and uh, in terms of the velocity distribution that we still need to measure, still need to work out. And when that goes in, I'm sure we put back in the simulations and uh, somebody will, will come up with an answer then and we'll, we'll get we'll get something. But it's still 0.07 astronomical units away. You know, it's it's uh, the, another reason we chose this is that it doesn't quite reach the Earth's orbit. So even if you really can't put it in my use of phrase, in English phrase, if you really cops it up, there is no way we can send the Morpheus or Dimos onto an Earth intercept directly. There was enough energy. So it's perfectly safe that way. So it makes it difficult to get that ejector onto Earth. But never say never. Let's wait and see what the simulations say. Now we're, now we're measuring the, the true uh, ejector velocity distribution. Well, that's bad news for me. <laughs> but it's good news for Earth and the satellites. I guess so, yes. <laughs> Okay, so, so if it's yes, yes, it, for people that uh, are online, the question was that uh, how did engineers optimize the design of DART to uh, to maximize the ejector? Well, um, it was primarily uh, the, the optimization was was just it was, the constraint wasn't that the constraint was getting that uh, spacecraft to. Didymos and Dimorphos by September 2022. And of course, if it's larger, then, then uh, um, it's, uh, you, you might increase the momentum, but of course, you, you've got the, the same launch system, so the, the, the velocity might be slower. So you really want to maximize the momentum there. And there were problems with, with the construction of DART. It missed the first launch window. The first launch window was in summer 2021, and that was, that was missed for a couple of reasons. Some of it was linked to basically supply chain issues coming out of the pandemic. Uh, so uh, it was 
it was lucky we had this backup launch window in, in November 21, which that was, and was a success. Um, uh, really, to maximize the, the deflection, you just want to throw in, throw in as much mass as fast as possible. And they really couldn't have done, I think, any better uh, than, than half a ton at six kilometers per second, something like that. And in particular, the important thing is it's a test. And we knew from just looking at beta, possible beta values and so on, is that they should move an asteroid enough that we could measure, measure their consequences and we could measure that movement and see the So that was, that was the most important thing. But we really had no idea, going back to it, no idea about how much ejector would come out because, as you saw, the simulations implied anything from no very little ejector up to a huge amount of ejector. And it turned out we were near the upper end of that scale. Well, do you think that now that we yeah, that, that, that's a really good question. So the question is, now we've got the results from DART, can that be used in the simulations to better predict what would happen in a, a kinetic deflector, uh, a proper kinetic deflector mission, if we really do have to do this uh, in real life? And the answer is yes, and that's why we're going back, because the whole point about, or one of the points about DART is to do this test to measure beta and therefore know that in our simulations, if we put in DART and we put in something with the size and with the structure of Dimorphos, we know we should get this beta value out. And so it acts as an anchor point for future simulations and future calculations what to do with different types of asteroids with different compositions and different structures um, and that's that's one of the reasons why we do need to go back with HERA to really do, get this mass measurement really precisely and actually also see what the effect was on the surface of the asteroid how much of the energy of DART for example went into redistributing mass around Dimorphos rather than ejecting it so it, you're absolutely right it will be really important for those future simulations uh, and calculations, particularly when we have something that's uh, part, going to pass us a little too close for comfort. Are there any questions on that? Oh, there's one behind. Yeah, I have a question Why did the Dirt import the Vola for I instead of the Allow Me? Okay, so uh, the question uh, was, why did DART employ the rollout solar arrays rather than the normal fixed or folding arrays? I don't know. Um, uh, certainly, of course, you need them in a compact space in the rocket, in the launcher fairing uh, uh, for, for launch. I think it's just, uh, it, it was, DART was a, a technology test demonstration mission in many forms. Of course, it was, it was primarily to test kinetic deflection techniques, but also there are other aspects to it. So for example, these roll-up solar arrays are, are, are hoped to be used in future uh, missions, particularly within the inner solar system. I didn't mention, for example, that the iron engine was a, de was, was a test of that, of that particular uh, model, that particular design of iron engine. Um, on DART as well. So there were, the, there were these other strategies as, as well. The important thing is that because the rollout solar arrays had been used, or has sorry, had been tested on the ISS previously, they'd been tested in space, so we knew it should work because if the if the uh, solar arrays don't work, then you really are snookered because you don't have any power to, to the yeah. spacecraft. The, 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 the iron engine, however, for example, it's only used very briefly at the start of the mission because the mission was designed that if the iron engine did develop a port, we would still get to Dimorphos. And indeed, it was only used at the start of the mission. Test, tests were done and thought, okay, now let's switch it off and let's just concentrate on, on the kinetic impact. No, I just Mm -hmm. That's, that, I, I agree, I agree, but I mean, those decisions were, were made elsewhere in the project. And in fact, it was, it was clearly successful, so one might expect to see these rollout solar arrays on future 
interplanetary missions, as I said, particularly within the inner solar system. It, it, they, they did a fantastic job. Let's take one more question. Back here. Yes. Uh, you said that you were um, very interested in the effect of the ejector being un um, not quite what you were expect expecting, um, and, and that you um, thought that this might be something to do with the bolder nature of the, uh, of the actual um, uh, asteroid. So one thing to do in, in terms of modeling, I know uh, we haven't got time to discuss it, but it's very interesting to try and address the, the nature of the, of the impacted material and put that into a model. When you've got something around about this sort of scale, you can start to use quite interesting modeling techniques with sort of discrete bodies. And I saw one of the images was sort of like discrete element arrangement. Mm -hmm. um, I just wonder whether you could say something about um, how people are multi scaling or working on models to get some representation of this particular nature. So, so just to repeat for people online, the, the question is, if I could summarize, it's, is that we've clearly got some interesting features caused by the boulder uh, distribution on the surface. And how can that be incorporated into the simulations? So I'm going to plead complete ignorance here, except I know that's going on right now. Uh, so the original simulation uh, that I showed of the distortion of Dimorphos was called out, carried out by Martin Jupsey and S S Sabina Radican. And Sabina is already now running models where she's implanted boulders of a similar size distribution as measured for uh, on Dimorphos and seen how that affects uh, the distribution of the ejector afterwards, and in particular how it affects beta. Be it, because clearly, um, you know, you, 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 maybe those boulders weren't moving out as fast, but there's a lot of there. Yeah. So you've got a lot of momentum tied up in those large parts. So I can't, honestly, I, I don't know any of the details of that modeling, but I know they're hard at it in the DART team. And I'm sure there'll be papers out, if not by the Planetary Defense Conference in Vienna uh, in April, but maybe in, by Asteroids, Comets and Meteors uh, in June. Great. Look forward to that. Yeah. All right. I think we'll give Alan a break. Please come up and chat to him afterwards. But that's big enough. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And thank you everybody online for attending. Yeah.